This episode of the podcast is brought to us by our very special sponsor. Who is that, Paul? Neste. Neste. We're so grateful to Neste, aren't we? What do they do? Do you, do you think they could be in the business of fighting climate change? I'm sure they're in the business of fighting climate change. I don't think they'd be sponsors of our show if they weren't. They probably wouldn't be. And do you think that they produce renewable fuels or do you think they invest in circular solutions? I wouldn't be at all surprised if they did both. Do you think they do? That would be very impressive. I really, they did both. I, genuinely, I do. Okay. And which country do you think they're from? Well, I think they're from Finland but I wouldn't be at all surprised if their products went all around the world. They probably do, don't they? We're very grateful to them. Thank you, Neste. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's Tom here. I just wanted to take a word at the top of the episode to say thank you. Last week, we asked you if you would provide us with a rating. And we had so many responses. It had such an impact. We are really grateful. If you haven't had a chance to do it yet, please do. And I wanted to share that I had an email from my aunt, who is a wonderful human being who I don't get to see enough of. And she wrote to me to say she listened to the podcast, which I didn't know. And she wanted to provide a rating, but she didn't know how to do it. So I am now going to hand over to our producer and our executive producer, who are both on the line, to give us a crash course. Clay, Marina, over to you. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, Tom's aunt, hello. Marina and I are going to walk you through how to give a rating on Apple Podcasts. And to our listeners, you can follow along with Marina and I and Tom's aunt at home. We're going to do this in three steps, but let's do it like um, like I'm the person giving a rating and Marina, you're going to show me how to do it. Okay, so if you're following along at home, do you have your phone out? Are you ready? Okay, you ready? Okay, let's do it. Okay, Marina, what is step one? Okay, so if you're listening to us on Apple Podcast, go to Outreach and Optimism. Click on the name of the show. Okay, so I see I'm at the show page. I see the artwork at the top and then a list of episodes. What is step two? So scroll all the way down to where you see the stars. Okay, I'm scrolling, scrolling. Okay, I see the stars. They're empty. Oh, it says tap to rate. Okay. What do I do? And you just click the star number you want, right? I think so. That might be step three. Marina, what is step three? Is there like a trick to this? The trick is you put your finger right to the right side of your phone and then almost like you slip it on the last star (laughs) and that will give us five. Okay, so I see the stars. I'm ready to tap. And then click five. Got it. Tom, I can see your picture right here above the star rating. And you're looking at me like <laughs> you're waiting to see what amount of stars I rate. <laughs> yeah, five is good. Yeah, Or else five. bad luck will befall you and your entire family for a thousand years. It's like your expression is saying. Give us five. Give us five. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that concludes our amazing audio guide on how to rate the podcast. Tom's aunt, I hope this was helpful. Um, if any of you at home are a visual learner, We're going to upload a video on how to rate the podcast on our social media channels. So you can check that out. Okay, that's it. Here's the episode. Hello and welcome to Outrage and Optimism. I'm Tom Rivet Karnak. I'm Christiana Figueres. And I'm Paul Dickinson. This week, we discuss the impact of the pandemic on geopolitics, and we speak to political strategist Ian Bremmer. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you for being here too, Tom. I really appreciate it. And, and you, Christiana. <laughs> and Clay. And Marina. And, and Marina. We're all here. Isn't it nice? Where are you this week? I mean, have you been traveling? Are you in a different place where you were last week? Have you have you been a long distance? If uh, if we had been somewhere, we couldn't tell you because it's against the law. <laughs> I suspect you probably have roamed rather widely around North London, Paul. Regent's Park. Christiana, where are you? Well, Marina and I have our daily trip. Travels. Can Paul remember the name? Yeah, Paul, can you remember where we are? But in, in that place, we have our daily travels from the bedroom to the kitchen to the outdoor patio back into the uh, bedroom slash office that Marina's bedroom is. Um, and, and sometimes we even go to um, 
our laundry room. There you are. That's our trowel. Okay. And Tom, uh, did we see you uh, breaking, flaunting the rules, uh, recording a TED talk in the beautiful woods <laughs> with squirrels and, uh, you know, the sunshine? Well, I don't know if it was illegal. It may have been. I don't think it was. It wasn't an intentional breaking of the law. So I have recorded a TED talk this week. I was invited to speak. And then, of course, TED is not happening this week. So I did it remotely. And you know what? It is very difficult to speak into a camera for 15 minutes without really having any response. And I ended up doing it in a natural environment. So I actually went out with a friend who was social distancing more than six six feet away at all times. And he's a cameraman, so he would put the camera in place and then I would, I would speak to the camera. But we decided to do it in nature because it felt like it was more appropriate and also more interesting than just doing it in my room. But of course, what that meant was we had all of the various challenges of being outside with not only the light moving around but cows wandering into shot and dog walkers yelling at us it took us weeks well not weeks but days to record this thing but it is done and i'm very happy with it have you guys seen it i have well tom despite all the difficulties may may this be one of many advertisements in pro of your ted talk because it is brilliant Oh, thank you. It's inspiring. It's compelling. It's also fun. Um, and I can highly recommend it. And it's going to be launched on Earth Day. Yes, next week it's coming out. So it's going to be part of this TED 2020, the prequel. So people who are supposed to be at TED will get to see it next week. And then the same day it will be put out on TED.com. Wow. So how do we see it? TED.com and then we type in Tom Rivet Karnak or can we type in Tom <laughs> is it Karnak? Rivet Karnak? Is it Rivet Karnak? Or is it Karnako? It all should work. No, Rivet Karnak is what I'm trying to Rivet establish. Karnak. If you two could possibly give me some help in that regard, that would be great. Okay, okay. With yeah. a double T. <laughs> That's right. Rivet Karnak. Okay. Mr. Paul, how, how are you? You're the only one of us who's all alone. Are you enjoying it? Uh, well, I'm all alone with uh, 8 million other Londoners being trying to be all alone with each other, which is not as easy as it sounds um, because it's quite a small city and it's a small park I go to every day. But uh, I'm getting like... Regent's conf- Park. Regent's Park. But I'm getting confused about social distancing because I feel really, really rude if I like avoid people. But then I know I'm also being very, very rude if I walk near people. Um, I hold my breath and I'm confused. That's just one thing I'm noticing. <laughs> and then the other thing is I'm endlessly thinking about what I would be thinking if I knew about now three months ago. Do you ever think like how crazy the news is now? And if you, you know, if November last year, if you saw it, your your mind would you, yeah. you, would go crazy. And I'm going to say something serious for a minute um, as we begin to transition possibly to the topic du jour. And that is, um, you know, this is not a very nice thing I'm about to say, but a tiny little bit of constriction in my life has made me think about the lives of people in prisons, to be honest with you. And tens of thousands of people in the UK, literally millions of people in the United States and many other countries, you know, people often who've actually grown up in some kind of government institution and are just, you know, just a tiny little taste of what it means to have no restricted liberty. It's it's, it's kind of gone, gone a little bit deep with me. So I just wanted to bring in that serious note. I actually read a piece when this was all starting that was written by a former inmate just about the trauma, you know, about um, have having lived through a prison sentence and then what that feels like afterwards and how terrified they were that, that this restriction was now coming in. No, I, I, it's interesting because I've been thinking about the same um, and particularly I've been thinking about Mandela, you know, in prison for 27 years. Jesus. And if any of you have been there the particular cell that he was in for 27 years was not particularly um, larger than his lying down body. Uh, and, and, and yet, and yet, what a mindset he developed for the moment that he walked out of jail, yeah. right? So, you know, there you go. There is the gold standard, folks. That's the model. Yeah. And to just just to stop being too human centric, uh, Marino has pointed out that there are animals in zoos, and indeed all animals in captivity um, uh, are, are, you know, should I guess equally we we can touch upon their plight. Although speaking of which, have you seen that the pandas? And I forget where. I think it might be somewhere in China that they've been trying to get to mate in captivity for like thirty years or something, generations of unsuccessful attempts. 
there can't be generations of unsuccessful attempts at mating, can there, now that I think about it? <laughs> but, but anyway, it, point, it, 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 it had been a long time that they've been trying to do that. And now that there's no visitors, it's, it's working for them. So, you know, it turns out that actually it was the people that was putting them off. No, it turns out they're prudes. <laughs> well, it's, it's not entirely unreasonable. I mean, thousands of people wandering past you, you know, with packets of crisps and, you know, cameras. But well, anyway, what do I know? Okay. Shall we pivot to what we're supposed to be talking about today? Indeed, Tom. Look, tell us about that. Okay. So actually, uh, we thought we'd have a slightly different structure to what's going to happen now. Um, those regular listeners will remember that last week, after our conversation with Professor Stiglitz, we got into a discussion about what the shape of international affairs will be as we move through to the other side of the pandemic. And Christiana in particular expressed real concern that we're not seeing instincts towards deeper cooperation and collaboration. And in fact, the reverse is coming into the fore. Walls are going up. Countries are pushing away from international cooperation, something that has been only emphasised more in the last few days, particularly today, with Trump's threat to withhold funding to the World Health Organization during a pandemic, which is insane. Um, But we thought we wanted to dig into this a little bit more and challenge ourselves to ask different questions about what's happening, not be trapped by our own habitual modes of thinking. And as a result, we have a slightly different kind of guest today. Ian Brammer is one of the world's foremost authorities on political risk. He is the originator of the idea of G0, the idea that we're entering a world which will be much more multipolar because no country will have the power to play the role that the United States has played in recent years, basically. as Sorry, Tom, I think his thesis is not that we're going into a multipolar, but into a zero polar, like zero. no leadership. Well, no no leadership, but as a result of that, it'll be multi-smaller poles, right? You know, no, but nobody, okay. yeah, nobody will play. And of course, as we look back at the last decades, people have different perspectives, but the role of the US in keeping global systems moving has actually been very powerful and effective. Anyway, so what we thought we'd do today was play you that interview now, and that will enable us to um, bring some of these deeper and different thoughts that Ian brought to our conversation. It's a fascinating conversation out. And then we'll have a kind of longer discussion afterwards about whether what he said and the discussion we had with him changed our perspective. Okay, let's hear from the expert. So today we are very excited to have Ian Brammer with us. Ian is president and founder of the political risk consulting firm Eurasia Group and G Zero Media. He's also the host of the podcast G Zero World with Ian Brammer, which we love and we thoroughly recommend that you you look up and you listen to. Um, Ian, we want to do a few things with you. There's so many different ways in which we could take this conversation. And, um, you know, given the intersection of geopolitics and the coronavirus and climate change. So we're going to try and have three distinct little conversations with you and um, and I'm going to kick them off, but we're all going to jump in with questions. The first is around international cooperation in response to the COVID virus and what you're seeing in terms of how countries are actually being able to work together. The second is on what you are anticipating international relations will look like after COVID. And then the third is a bit of a crystal ball discussion around how easy or difficult it's going to be to deal with climate crisis in that world that we're going to be stepping into. But just to start off right now on the international cooperation in the response that we're seeing, uh, you said recently that trying to deal with COVID on a country by country basis is like trying to deal with cancer by going to an ophthalmologist and having them examine your eyes. Uh, They might help you with your vision, but you're still going to have cancer. And we actually talked about this at length on our last Um, edition of our podcast and we use a slightly different analogy but basically made the same point that is that if a group of people are in a boat and there's a hole in it it's not only the ones sitting closest to the hole that are going to drown so right now from our perspective and we're curious to know from yours we would say we're sort of seeing precisely the wrong instinct emerge in terms of the global response to the pandemic countries are looking at their own needs and not engaging sufficiently in global cooperation to ensure we come through this together to just kick us off can you unpack for us what if if that is indeed what you're seeing why that's the case and whether you're seeing any signs of light that wisdom is breaking through that we can't do this country by country we have to do it together Yeah, I mean, it's our first G0 crisis, Um, Mm. you know, uh, not a G7, not a G20, but an absence of leadership. And 
That's been coming for a long time. I first wrote about the coming G0, the collapse of the old U.S.-led global order, but with nothing yet taking its place, almost 10 years ago. And there are a lot of reasons for it. I mean, some of it is that the United States itself doesn't want to play the historic role it has as um, the sheriff uh, of, of the global military and security order, the architect of the global trade order, the cheerleader of global values. Uh, mm. I mean, an awful lot of inequality inside the United States and feeling like the average American wasn't taken care of makes a lot of Americans say, we're sick of this. We're, mm. not, we're not in favor of, of the globalism that has been promoted by our established parties. And as you know, that's not just in the U.S. We see that across most advanced industrial democracies. The only exception is Japan. Um, in Japan, because you don't have the inequality, the population is actually shrinking. So even though the pie is not growing, the average piece of that pie for the people living there is getting a little larger. They have no immigration to speak of, and they're not allowed to fight in wars outside their borders. So Japan mm. is really the exception and, and then beyond that, you also have Russia in serious decline, blaming the United States and the West for that, trying to undermine uh, those countries, the transatlantic alliance, and delegitimize their institutions further. And the Chinese, who are the, the rising power, certainly economically and technologically, and even to a degree in soft power, and we can get into that if you want, but, but not aligning with the United States. I mean, the big thing that most in the West got wrong in the last 10, 20 years was this idea that as China got more powerful, it would somehow adapt hmm. to become more of a free market economy, more of a democratic system. And that is absolutely not happening. China's gotten much more powerful and, and they've consolidated their authoritarian regime and they've consolidated their state capitalist economic and technological system. So we had all the preconditions for a geopolitical recession, for the old U.S.-led order breaking down, but it doesn't become as obvious until there's a crisis in the same way that you can have a pier jutting into the water and it erodes and erodes and erodes. But if you're standing on the pier and it's a perfectly beautiful day, you don't necessarily know that it's about to fall apart. Suddenly a storm comes through and you go, oh my God, the pier's about to fall into the ocean. Well, that's precisely what we're seeing now because not only do we have a crisis in this G0 order, but the scale of the crisis is actually the largest, the greatest, the most concerning, the most global of anything we've seen since World War II. And the capacity to respond internationally is actually so much more challenging than what we experienced after 9-11 or mm. after the 2008 financial crisis. So that, that's a little geopolitical backdrop for why this is so dysfunctional. Uh, what we're experiencing. Sorry, Ian, you're saying this is bigger than the breakup of the Soviet Union, the fall of communism. This is the biggest thing since World War II. In terms of the scale of the crisis, sure. I mean, you, you could focus on um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which, of course, I mean, had we gotten it wrong, had the potential to really bring everything down. Uh, but it, it we didn't, and it didn't. And so the actual impact of that crisis on the global order was pretty limited, where the actual impact of this crisis on the way the world will work, yeah, I, I think has much more significant implications for all of us living on this planet than anything since World War II. I'd make that argument. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ian, so you coined this term in 2011, G0, because you correctly observed uh, that we were in a total vacuum of, uh, of leadership, or in fact, even willingness to be leaders uh, on so many different issues. And so G7 is no more G8, G6, G20, G77. I mean, you name the, the the G's, um, and and you very accurately basically took them all off the table for different reasons and came to your conclusion of G zero. Now, here we are with the biggest thing since World War II. Uh, I'm sure you feel justified in having foreseen that we would be here, but because we are hitting such rock bottom. Are we so far down that we might begin to bounce back up? And let me just put two 
possibilities there for you to take a big bat and um, and and bat them off the table. <laughs> One, of course, would be uh, a still surprising election result in the United States that might put a very, very different view of the world in the White House. And the other, with or without a different, uh, a, a surprising election result in the United States, the other is China. The fact that China has done more than any other country to support both industrialized as well as developing countries, sending doctors, sending equipment, sending all kinds of support to many of the countries that are being very, very hit. Are they doing that just because it's the thing to do right now? Or are these actually very interesting steps toward a China that is assuming a much more strategic international leadership role? Certainly, I mean, those are two, those are the two questions to ask, which is, could the United States reassert itself or could China emerge um, as a more effective and responsible leader? Um, and, and the answer in both cases um, are, I certainly doubt it. Um, Why is that? Uh, in the case of China, um, of course, they are responsible uh, for this crisis, the original sin of the pandemic was caused because the Chinese willfully covered up um, the human-to-human -human transmission and the extent of the problem for a full month, while 5 million Chinese traveled out of Wuhan and 400 plus thousand traveled out of the country from Wuhan, leading to the pandemic, mm -hmm. right? And they, 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 that's, they refused to allow in the World Health Organization to do independent testing and, uh, and, and actually you know, presented to the WHO that there was no human to human transmission. So that's a big problem. And the Americans are blaming them for that and will blame them for that. And it's very interesting that with Biden now as the presumptive nominee, President Trump's first advertisements against him and, and the statements made from the head of the campaign are that Biden is soft on China. So you can see that dynamic playing out at least until, say, January, when we might or might not have a new president. But on the Chinese side, first, China's gonna have to dig itself out of that hole. Now, there's no question that since that um, has come to pass, the Chinese government recognized they had a really big issue um, that they were responsible for, and they had to clean it up, uh, both domestically and to the extent that they could internationally. And, and they have uh, done a lot of work. Uh, and, and the technologically empowered surveillance state that they have um, has been extraordinarily effective um, at making a quarantine strongly limit um, further expansion inside China and allowing them to reopen their economy, which right now looks like about 70% back in terms of their supply chain, not consumption, and probably will be back close to 100% by sometime in May, while the Americans and Europeans are still functionally shut down. And, and then you have the fact that the Chinese are providing some masks, some test kits, some medical personnel to the Europeans, to other countries around the world, while the Americans are focusing on the United States. So, I mean, historically, the Americans did the most in humanitarian aid, Chinese are clearly learning from the U.S. experience historically. The Americans perhaps are forgetting their experience historically. Yeah. The Chinese are doing a good job propagandizing everything they're giving. But, I mean, it's nowhere close to the hole that's necessary to be filled. And more importantly, as we get through um, the immediacy of the healthcare crisis and start looking more significantly at the massive economic hole that the developing world is going to need to fill. Um, certainly the heads of the international financial institutions and the UN that I've been talking to have been very skeptical that China is going to play anywhere close to the kind of role that the Americans have been capable of playing historically. Um, so, no, I, I don't expect that the Chinese are going to fill that hole. And if Biden were to win, which right now is a coin flip, but let's say the 50 percent chance ish that Biden wins, you still have a U.S. economy that is 
very deeply needing support to get the hell out of this crisis. You have an additional minimum 10% of the workforce that has a social contract is broken and doesn't have a productive thing to do. And the necessity of the U.S. leader in focusing on that and the Europeans in focusing on that to ensure that the people that voted them in actually feel like their government is fit for purpose is going to be first, second, and third order well before you talk about what the rest of the world needs and gets. So, I mean, I I think that uh, we are quite some ways away from being able to talk about what the post-G0 world is likely to look like. Well, that's interesting. That was actually going to be the question I was going to ask. I mean, I want to make sure I leave a bit of time to talk about climate change. But if you if you take that thesis you just unpacked, right, the US is unlikely to reassert leadership under any election scenario. China is unlikely to step into that vacuum in anything like the role that the US has played. So just kind of, you know, and then we kind of come out of this pandemic towards the end of this year, early next year, in a world that those trends have taken a, a big jump further forward. What does that world look and feel like to live in? You know, how do the geopolitics play out in a way that's different? Presumably, it's much more multipolar, much more complicated. Talk us through that. It's more multipolar. Um, The United States uh, has lost some influence vis-a-vis China um, in descending order to Southeast Asia, um, in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, in East and Southern Europe, the poorer countries with less infrastructure and less worries about national security vis-a-vis China than the Germans or the UK, um, and then South America. So in the, the poorest developing world, not India, um, certainly not Mexico, um, probably not as much of the Middle East, you see the Chinese with more influence than they had. You see more hedging away from the Americans and towards China. Hmm. You also see a lot more structural inequality uh, between the developing world and the developed world because the developing world does not have the capacity to respond effectively to this crisis um, and herd immunity because the healthcare system isn't up to it, because the governance isn't as good, because a lot of people couldn't socially distance if they want to. 25% of Brazilians living in favelas, you can't socially distance there. More like 40% in India, more like 70% in Nigeria. And you also have more structural inequality inside the United States and inside Europe as the fourth industrial revolution increasingly looks like the post-industrial revolution for many of those that were formerly in the working Hmm. and middle classes. The big open question will be, are we in a full-fledged Cold War between the Americans and Chinese? And I think it's too early to say that yet. I would also point out that even as America's influence compared to China decreases on the margins in the developing world, America's power compared to its allies is actually going up. Hmm. The role of the dollar, the role of big tech companies who are clearly the winners in this environment, but the Europeans, the Canadians, the Japanese have none of them. They're Hmm. all American. And if you desperately need, right, the tech companies to get your economies back up and running and do the geo tracking of individuals who do and do not have immunity, who have and have not gotten this disease, um, well, I mean, the Americans are going to make a lot more of the rules and privacy in Europe is going to matter a lot less, right? Plus the fact that the U.S. is the largest energy producer, the largest food producer, has the reserve currency, the dollar, and and the Chinese currency still isn't convertible. Um, I'd be careful at ideas of just because the Chinese are doing a better job vis-a-vis the U.S. and coming out of this crisis, that that means somehow the Americans are in inexorable decline. No, Hmm. I think the Americans are going to become more unilateralist and more transactionalist, even under Biden. But that doesn't mean the Americans are in inexorable decline at all. So, Ian, just like a supplementary before we get on to climate change, if I may. Um, You know, during the crisis, we've had Bill Gates, for example, you know, he he gave this TED talk five years ago where he predicted this. And, uh, you know, he's not to everyone's taste, I know. But um, just hearing him talk, he has this particular voice of um, somebody looking from a global perspective. He'll talk about people in the uh, advanced economies. He'll talk about people in developing economies. That voice of what you could call global interest, 
I mean, to what degree may we see it flourish in um, a rejuvenated United Nations system? To what degree may corporations represent it? Do you see the sort of green shoots of something beyond this tribal nationalism? Uh, I think that globalism um, is failing. Uh, And I think it's failing not because I don't like it, but rather because so many people have been left behind in individual countries despite the extraordinary global growth. And I think that the nature of this virus, which is all about we need walls, we need control, we need to ensure that we can literally have people distance shelter in place. It's the opposite of globalism and globalization is driving us more in that direction. Now, you want to talk about climate change. There are a lot of crises coming down the pike of which climate is an obvious, perhaps most important. And you've got the ethics of AI and displacement. You've got cybersecurity. You've got the next pandemic or three. I mean, all of those things require global coordination to respond to them. Um, Very unclear to me that you're going to get it. Hmm. And and I I mean, I, I personally have an enormous amount of respect for Bill Gates, what he has done. Uh, and I mean, full disclosure, the Gates Foundation is a big client of my firm, Eurasia Group. So we work quite closely with them. And I know Bill pretty well. But leave that aside. He's given away half of the world's largest fortune to try to make a difference and not just for his fellow Americans. I, I have enormous respect for the good that he has done with his fortune. But the future of the world right now is not being driven primarily by Bill Gates, and we need to understand that. So we're really keen. I mean, it's 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 really interesting to have this analysis from you set out the reality of what we're facing. I wanted to ask you a question about climate change and about the ability of the world that you're describing to respond to climate change. Because, of course, in a way, what's happened with the pandemic is we knew a terrible thing was going to happen and we did nothing really to prepare for it. And climate change has a lot of analogies in that way. I have a strong instinct that as we have Christiana on the line who led the world to a diplomatic breakthrough on climate and you're talking about basically the challenges of cooperation going further, I think actually it'd be really interesting for Christiana to phrase this question in the way that you would like to, Christiana. Well, I've I've been thinking about it, actually, as you've been speaking, Ian, because um, obviously the the first take on this traditionally is to say uh, climate is the ultimate multilateral test for cooperation around the world. Now, if the psychological effect of isolationism is going to be sticky to us as individuals and to nations uh, at large, but we still have to vanquish climate change. Then I've been wondering, how do you square that circle? Because not addressing climate change is not an option because it would lead basically to existential uh, threat for humanity. So that is not even an option. So how do you address climate change in the era of isolationism? Am, Am I getting too desperate? (laughs) <laughs> uh, no, it's obviously a bad time to ask this question um, because at the beginning of this year, we were only talking about climate, right? At Davos, you've got Greta Thunberg, right? I mean, like she's now sheltering in place. Hmm. So, I mean, this year in terms of the ability to talk meaningfully about further climate coordination, everything has been pushed back on the pandemic. And, you know, you're only so concerned about the polar bears uh, and the whales uh, when you're worried about the actual physical safety of your grandma, right? So, I mean, let's be clear. And and for those people that have said, well, climate's the ultimate global response, and actually a pandemic feels pretty global response, right? So mm. let's, let's not, you know, let's not uh, go too far. But I, I'm actually much more optimistic long-term about the ability to respond to climate And the reason for that is because I think that around the world, the science of climate um, has advanced suitably that almost everyone has figured out we're going to have to actually invest in these new technologies long term. Like even if we're not doing it fast enough and we're not doing coordinated fashion, we are doing it. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, just when you see that solar power is cheaper than coal, 
which 10 years ago is not remotely the case, right? You see the advances in battery technology and storage and transmission and all of that. Um, You know, we're not where we want to be, but it seems to me pretty clear, like you're not going to be in the same way you can't stop AI from happening. And that makes me much more concerned about the future of humanity. You can't stop the advances in non-fossil fuel-based energy technology Mm. from happening. And that makes me more optimistic about humanity, even if we're going to have an awful lot of the world's poorest and least connected suffering and dying unnecessarily as we get from here to there. Um, So, uh, you know, you're right. You don't get global cooperation and coordination. It's fits and starts. But, you know, a pandemic, when you suddenly need leadership and you need us to work together on medical supply chain and work together on fighting the virus, now we fail. And we particularly fail in a G0 environment where climate, when we've known about it for half a century and science is almost full consensus with most global leaders around the world today, and that's only going to continue, it's only going to be more obvious you can afford and tolerate a lot less geopolitical alignment than you Mm -hmm. can with the pandemic. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Very interesting take. Um, And is that mitigated at all by the current um, oil price crisis, assuming, well, either way, either they figure out how to stabilize the price or not. But in any event, it is not where the oil producing countries would want to have it. Yeah, of course. Uh, But that's, you know, also because uh, global demand has fallen off a cliff and that that comes from this crisis. But that's a very short term issue. I mean, that demand will rebound, whether it takes six months or 18. From a climatological perspective, that's a blip. Hmm. Um, And as that happens, prices will then come up, maybe with a six month or one year lag because there's lots of excess in storage. But yep. nonetheless, it doesn't change the broader trajectory of where the world is heading on on energy usage. Ian, this has been great. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. This has been such an insightful conversation. Can I just ask before we let you go, we call this podcast Outrage and Optimism. We think both of those are necessary to particularly deal with the, the threat of climate. Um, as you look at the way the world is dealing with this crisis, um, do you feel more outraged or do you feel more optimistic? I don't get outraged. That's not my that's not my temperament. Um, you know, I'm not one of these people that gets emotionally undone because mm. I think it would undermine my analysis, which is the only way I can make a difference in this world, mm. or at least the most effective way. So for me, outrage would really undermine kind of my 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 core human mission. Okay, and and optimism. <laughs> Uh, Are you optimistic? I'm an existential optimist. I kind of can't believe that we're here. I don't, we didn't do anything (laughs) to deserve it. So, I mean, every, every day is a mitzvah. Um, You know, I mean, we should, uh, I I think uh, gratefulness is probably the, the fundamental driver of my core. Nice. Very nice. Cultivate an attitude of gratitude. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ian. Thanks very much. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Okay, so that was an amazing conversation we felt with with Ian. Um, Christiana, after we'd hung up with him, we carried on chatting on the phone for a few minutes and you had some really interesting reflections and you were kind of challenging your own thinking in light of some of the things he said. Do you want to share any of that with the listeners now? Yeah, um, two things that I wanted to bring to the fore. Um, the, the first is just underlining once again in case we haven't done so enough the absolute paramount importance of the U.S. election this year. I mean, there are seldom, it it is seldom the case that one political event has so many ramifications at macro and micro scale all at the same time. So just, you know, to keep that one um, in mind, not that any of us, well, other than Clay, Um, can vote in the United States. But um, I'm just really taken by by that overwhelming impact that that election is going to have. Can I just ask, and I don't want to derail your thought, but it was interesting that you made that point to him and he basically said, yes, it's super important, but it won't change the trajectory 
which is already set, which is that the US is a fading power and will not be able to play the role it's previously played on the world stage anymore, whoever is elected. Did you agree with that analysis? Well, not entirely, because I do think that um, that political direction is set at the top. Uh, and uh, and Obama has just given a speech endorsing Biden. Uh, and of course, if Biden is elected, it's the Biden administration, not the Obama administration. But there are many indications from that speech. Obviously, he wouldn't have given that speech without having shown it to Biden ahead of time. And there are many indications in that speech of at least a willingness at the top to uh, for the United States to regain uh, leadership based on regaining sanity, I should say. Mm. So um, I wouldn't take it off the table quite as quickly as um, uh, as Ian does, but um, but sorry to actually come to your question, Tom. Sorry, sorry. to come to your question. Um, I've been thinking about the following without coming to any conclusion, um, and I'm really interested in your guys' reaction. It strikes me that um, when we were working toward the Paris Agreement, we actually constructed a global framework that was two-tiered, not one-tiered. The bottom tier was, as we know, the nationally determined contributions because those are the results of having asked everyone, what is in your interest? What is your self-enlightened interest? And uh, where do you want to see your development go over the next few decades? So very much of a um, national approach. Let's, Let's call it in today's parlance, behind the high walls of my national boundary. And and 189 countries put that on the table. Hmm. But that wasn't enough. And then we had the second tier that complements that, which is the harvesting of all of that and put it into an international framework. Well, at, at the risk of, you know, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So at the risk of making everything look like a nail now that we have the Paris Agreement, then everything has to be compared, at least in our brain, to that. But I've been wondering, do you think that it might be possible for us to have an approach both to COVID as well as to climate that starts at the national level, that is geared toward enlightened self-interest, but that doesn't stop there, that can be harvested multilaterally. Because, you know, I, I have to say, I have the tendency to think always that cooperation is better than not, or that cooperation is better than competition, and that multilateralism is better than nationalism. That's my bent in life, so I'm transparent about that. But the fact is, that's not the way that we constructed the Paris Agreement, now that we think about it. We did it very much based on national efforts, and then we constructed this global uh, uh, framework around it. So maybe, just maybe... um, Maybe we could have a two-tiered approach again. I think it's fascinating. And it's something which I've thought about as well, right? I mean, I think that the bottom-up nature of the Paris Agreement, the national commitments that came forward that got rolled into an international agreement, had a whole bunch of benefits for us in the road to Paris. The principal one being that a, the breakthrough was possible, whereas previously it had been impossible to get every country to agree to exactly the same thing, given that it's different circumstances. And it seems to me that one of the reasons that it was more possible was that less sovereignty was required to be pooled, right? There was still a shared effort, but it still felt like I, as my country, am doing my thing that I determine in my way, and I will then meet others once I've developed that myself. That's not less sovereignty, that's more sovereignty. But what I mean is you you were required to give up less of your decision making over your own country yes yes less yes yeah you're you're compromising your sovereignty less you compromise your sovereignty less and and yeah and that's the thing that people get really quite agitated about is when international multilateralism requires a high amount of compromising of your own ability to make decisions about your own country correct so i think what that so that's the good side 
right? And then that becomes a kind of multilateralism that should be more appealing to a wider range of political actors and politicians in different countries who have these more nationalistic instincts. So that is very good. That's the first but, tier. Yeah. The downside, of course, and we face this with Paris, is how do you know it's enough if it's all nationally determined? At the end of the day, you, it has to roll up into a there there so that you know it's enough collectively from all of the national commitments to deal with the problem. And that's what observers who are more traditional multilateralists will say is, well, how do you know you're solving the entirety of the problem if it's just nationally determined? Right. So that's the tier two, right, yeah. that I was talking about that piece. Um, but as you will remember, we knew from the start that the collection of the tier one contributions, the national based, uh, was not going to be enough. And that's why we extended the period, right? That's why we said, right, so we're we're going to look at three decades of efforts all the way down to 250. And that mechanism has not yet been really tested. Correct. Right. So so that remains to be seen. So I think part of yeah. the answer to your question is, does that tier two work mm -hmm. in as the politics deteriorates? Yes, correct. That's not an answer to my question. That is the no, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm admiring the problem rather than answering it. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, it's such a beautiful problem. I just want to add to it if I can, you know, and, and try and build up the problem so it goes from being like super complex to infinitely complex. Um, but the point I would make is that I think part of what I thought was was brilliant about the the process that you uh, originated around Paris was the inclusion of the non-state actors. And what I want to highlight there, I mean, you know that that's been the, 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 the political entity I've found particularly interesting to work with for 20 years is that there's a sort of homogenizing force from, from global corporations, global investors that create norms of behavior and actually you know, do restrict government's activity and independence to some degree. And they also create a mood. But it is to some extent a kind of multilateral mood, but it's not intentionally so. It's kind of a, a default uh, a multinational one. But I mean, you know, we, we talk about the United Nations and, and, and the United Nations coming together. But I, I do also wonder, you know, when so many of the largest economies are in fact corporations and not nations, the degree to which they're sort of it not we, we we haven't found a way to include them in this debate. We don't really talk about it. It's easy to talk about, you know, the minister of this or the prime minister or the president. They turn up and they come off an airplane and they appear to be kind of running things and they control the army and the police and they're very important. Don't get me wrong. But there is this other force which is, you know, pervades our society. You know, it's like the the role of of business and commerce it's 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 like the water and we're the fish you know they say that the fish are not aware of the water because it's everywhere that's how i feel about the 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 and it's not just commerce you know it, it's actually the the role of commerce in delivering technology which is one of the greatest political actors changing society so just i'm sorry to make the beautiful problem more more complex but hopefully make it a little bit more beautiful and a little bit more solvable by understanding it better so let me ask, now that we've had this conversation, we had last week the kind of realisation, and I think for you in particular, Christiana, a kind of, a bit of a kind of, you know, a, a bit of a heartfelt moment where you kind of looked at what was happening and it, and it broke your heart a bit because you've worked your life for cooperation and collaboration on the international stage. And, and to some degree, that's fraying. Um, and then this discussion with Ian that sort of opened other possibilities, but was also pretty brutal in sort of his assessment of really what was going on right now. Where's that left you now in terms of outrage, optimism? Do you feel that there's something emerging here which can be inspiring? Um, or do you really feel that something's slipping away? Well, honestly, I'm more into the outrage these days than into the optimism. But But it's not about the fraying of multilateralism. My outrage is about the indifference to the humanitarian crisis. Mm. My outrage is about our blindness to, um, to the inequality that was already growing, but that is going to grow exponentially with, with COVID. And then, and then, if those recovery packages are not put in place with the green strings attached that we have discussed, um, can you imagine, can you imagine the pressure again on the most vulnerable? Because the most vulnerable 
are the same most vulnerable to everything. In each case. They're the most vulnerable in each case, right? If we had different groups of people, but no, it's always the same people. It's the bottom of the pyramid. Those are the ones that are most vulnerable to diseases, that are most vulnerable to climate change, that are most vulnerable to economic crisis and losing their income. It's just one thing after the other, after the other, after the other. And so that's where my outrage is right now. That is where I'm just, you know, irate, frankly, irate that um, that recovery packages are being designed um, f- for the benefit of, I don't know, of, of, of saving a particular sector. I'm not against saving a sector, whether it's an airline sector or cruise ships or whatever was announced today. Fine. But under what conditions? Under what conditions? Because, you know, the wrong saving of those sectors is going to have a direct negative impact on the most vulnerable who never get on an airplane and never get on a cruise ship. That's my point. That's why I'm angry. Okay, but let's just, let me try to do a little bit of alchemy with you here, Christiana, a little bit. Okay, try, Paul. (laughs) <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's not easy and i'm going and i'm afraid but i'm i'm Ca- got, i've got cannon to left of him cannon to right of him i've got my heart is beating with one thought and that is you know we and i'm sure everyone listening to us is want our change makers we want to see uh you know a just and a fair empathetic world and we have never in human history i don't think had such an enormous shared experience as the last couple of months and the next couple of months. So I'm not saying I know how to do it, but I'm saying we've been touched together by something. And if we can't pull from that a sense of uh, a broadening of our understanding and our empathy, then, you know, we we, we will have blown, uh, we will have wasted an incredible opportunity. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm totally with you on that, right? I do think that we're standing at the most incredible crossroads right now. If, you know, if, if we hit rock bottom, which we will uh, in a couple of weeks or months with this COVID, if one, once we hit rock bottom, if we decide the way to come back up is through, let's call it our enlightened human being um, thinking, well, then, you know, then I'm a happy camper. Then, you know, maybe that was the price that we had to pay uh, in the evolution of humankind to get to that realization. But what if we don't? That's what makes me very, very concerned. What if we don't? What if we dig ourselves into the hole and we just, you know, continue to knock our head against the wall and say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm really smart. I'm really smart. And we're knocking ourselves against the wall. I mean, how stupid can we be? Okay, Tom, it's time to send you into battle with Christiana. <laughs> I have worked with Christiana for a long time and I have learned that I don't try and persuade her of anything. Um, but I do think that she's right. You know, this is outrageous that we're at this point and the most vulnerable are going to feel this unbelievably hard. I mean, the tough thing about this moment is you can't bring it to resolution. It's not that we can say something that kind of lands all this stuff. It's all up in the air. We don't know how it's going to land. And we're all having to learn to live with things being up in the air all the time. I'm reminded of a short story which um, I tell in my TED Talk, which is due out next week. Um, And it comes from uh, the road to the Paris Agreement. And I don't know if you know this, but the work of the UN is delivered mainly in the form of extremely boring meetings. And when I first joined the UN, I had to sit through these meetings and I wasn't ready for them and they were torturous. And then in the middle of one of the meetings, I was handed a note by Christiana. And I assumed that it would be political instructions about how we were going to make progress and I looked at the note and it said painful but let's approach with love and it had a profound effect on me that note because I realized as I looked at it that it was both a kind of human response to her seeing the fact that I was going what the hell is going on here but it was also a kind of political instruction because when we were able to take that really gritty and difficult challenging quagmire of a situation and change the way that we approached it, we could in time transform the thing itself. It feels small and not enough 
when faced with all these challenges, but it's what we can do. And actually, that's how the world is always changed. So this has been a tough conversation this week. This has been hard and we're going to have hard conversations. We should be having hard conversations because this is a hard thing to live through. But we're going to keep coming back each week. We're going to have these discussions. We're going to find the most interesting people who are at the cutting edge of trying to work out how do we move through this? How do we come back stronger? How do we build back better? All of that possibility is still in front of us. We have deep confidence in humanity. We have seen so much as in the last decades we face so much we will face this too and we will come forward and we will build back stronger that doesn't mean it's going to be easy but we're going to be keep trying to have the hard conversations from here to there so we really appreciate you joining us we really appreciate you listening um we appreciate all of the outreach that you give us all the conversations that you draw us into um thank you so much for that please do keep interacting with us engaging with us listening to the podcast we'll be back in a week's time thanks for joining us today see you next week bye bye so there you go another episode of outrage and optimism outrage and optimism is a production of global optimism and is produced by me clay carnell and executive produced by marina mancilia german it's not just us that puts this together there is a team Thank you to Callum Grieve, Pete Kluttenbrock, Sarah Thomas, Chloe Revel, Daniel Fink, Sylvie Snow Thomas, and the team at L Communications, Zoe Cholak Antich, Lara Richardson, Sharon Johnson, Nigel Topping, and Michael Northrup. A special thanks this week to Irina, Kim, and Adana from the Erasure Group for making this week's interview possible. And thank you to our guest, Ian Bremer. So here's my PSA. COVID-19 is still in our communities and every small action that we take to self-isolate, wash hands, and keep ourselves from spreading the virus saves human lives. I put a link in the show notes, the World Health Organization's guidelines on how to protect yourself and those you love in this strange, strange time. Not just in a pandemic, but definitely in a pandemic, we need to be listening to and obeying the guidance of virologists and epidemiologists. And hey, they have those at the World Health Organization. So check the link in the description to read up on what they're instructing us to do at this time. Thank you. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Global Optimism. You know, add us, follow us, DM us. We'll see you on the interwebs. Next week, we've got another episode coming your way. So hit subscribe. We'll see you then.